great pleasure to welcome Professor Lulu Chan uh, to give the seminar today. So um, for those of you who, who don't know Lulu, uh, she did her undergraduate and PhD in uh, China, I think in Nanjing in Shanghai, um, before moving to uh, Caltech, where she worked with, um, in particular with Eric Winfrey, which is how I got, got to know her. And while she was there, they did some really quite remarkable work in a number, a number of times. It was like, oh, here's another paper, and it's massively pushed the boundary of what people can achieve with nucleic acid nanotechnology again. Really, um, nucleic acid nanotechnology is a field where people um, will say, look, it has the potential to do X, Y, Z, and X, Y, Z sounds really cool, but then people will actually demonstrate something really quite um simple by comparison and then i always felt like lulu and eric actually believed the hype and therefore would actually try to demonstrate the really impressive uh, big systems with it um and so a series of those uh, experiments and then they have continued after a brief trip to uh, the wiss institute in harvard lulu's now set up her own lab where she continues to uh, do pretty much the same thing generate um, amazing papers that really blow everyone else out the water so I'm really looking forward to hearing her speak today. Um, as we go along, if anyone has any questions, put them in the chat box. If I think it's particularly pertinent, I will interrupt. Otherwise, we'll return to them at the end. But without further ado, uh, Lulu, please uh, take over. Sounds good. Thank you, Tom, for that very nice introduction. I'll just go ahead and jump in. If I can switch my slides. OK. so. Machines can be programmed to carry out mechanical tasks and especially roles that humans cannot do well or do not wish to do. And these tasks exist at all scales. And I am particularly fascinated by how to make machines out of molecules and program them to perform tasks at the nanometer to micrometer scale. And to do that, I like to first uh, think about the engineering principles that are desired for building molecular machines. So one could use complex mechanics to build simple behavior, which is a fun challenge, or to do the opposite. We can use simple mechanics to build complex behavior if the right building blocks are wired together in the right ways. And because molecules are pretty difficult to manipulate, and it is probably easier to focus on simple mechanics that could be composed together for interesting functions. Then remote control vehicles allow humans to direct the machines to do just the right things, but with a combination of embedded computation within the vehicles, they can perform some tasks on their own and handle unforeseen situations in an environment that humans don't necessarily have the full knowledge of. And because a molecular environment could have lots of unknowns, it will be desirable to build molecular machines that are capable of performing autonomous tasks. Now, machines built for, for a specific task can be optimized for just that task, but modular machines that are reconfigurable could be used for a variety of different tasks and adapt their behavior to changes in the environment. And because it will be difficult to build an army of molecular machines, each optimized for a specific task, and to have them collectively make a decision for which ones should be in action in response to a changing molecular environment, it will probably be desirable to build molecular machines that can reconfigure themselves to efficiently perform different tasks. And so overall, I'm interested in developing algorithms and architectures for molecular machines that utilize simple mechanics, embedded computation, and task-specific reconfiguration. So today, I will tell you one example story for each of these three principles. And first, how do we use simple mechanics for complex behavior? Well, there are three important types of motors in natural molecular machines. Motors such as kinesin perform transportation tasks to deliver molecules to where they're needed. And motors such as actin network perform shape reconfiguration tasks to allow mobility and adaptability of cells. And then motors such as uh, RNA polymerase 
perform assembly and disassembly tasks um, to build molecules when they're needed. And now accordingly, in the field of DNA nanotechnology, we have seen all three types of motors, and some of them are called robots. So here, I like to focus on motors and robots that perform transportation tasks. So this is a uh, large warehouse in China. So on one side of the room, you can see that the incoming packages are being loaded onto these robots. And now with Uh, excuse me. Uh, we seem to have some audio issues. We can't hear you very well. And then sort of like sent out the world. Sorry, I'm... that music louder than I thought. <laughs> it might okay, be worth so... maybe replaying the um the slide and then speaking on the slide after it so that everybody can see what happened in it. Ah. Is there a delay in how soon my slides are showing up? Um, no, they just see some issues or you talking over it. So if you were to let the light slide play and then the audio can play and then you can speak after the I audio see. finishes. OK, I think that might be the only one that has a sound. <laughs> so we should be good to move forward. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so we developed the DNA robots to perform a similar task. And now these robots can pick up molecular packages on one side of the room on the surface of a DNA nanostructure and then drop them off to the other side of the room. And the drop off location is determined based on a DNA barcode, like a zip code, tacked to each molecular package. So I started this project when I was a postdoc working with a team of undergrads with help from Neuron General Serenovus, Damian Woods, and Eric Winfrey. But we didn't get and a new I joined my lab. She took over the project and led it to a beautiful completion. And so the history uh, of building DNA molecules that can walk around started over 10 years ago. And their first steps were powered by adding DNA strands to the test tubes one at a time. And then soon um, they were able to walk autonomously with the help of enzymes or deoxyribozymes. And if we look at the numbers uh, of the steps that they can take, that number has been growing exponentially over the years. And then DNA walkers that use just a base pairing were also developed with consistent progress over the years. More recently, DNA walkers become capable of walking while performing additional tasks. And proudly, we were able to build a DNA robot that bumps up the complexity of this particular category to approximately 300 steps. So I believe that two strategies that played an important role in building this cargo sodium robot is to use simple algorithms that are compatible with simple and modular building blocks and explore molecular processes that are energy efficient. OK, so let's imagine if we were to design a macroscopic robot to perform a cargo sorting task, we probably consider the following algorithms. Um, the robot would systematically explore the relevant area, like your Roborock does. And if it bumps into a cargo, pick up the cargo, recognize the cargo type, and choose a path directly to the destination for this cargo type, and drop it off at the destination. And then the robot repeats the process until all cargos are sorted. And to implement this algorithm, the robot should have a memory for where it has been, the ability to recognize different types of cargos, and a procedure for choosing to pass desired destinations. And obviously, it will be very hard to program all that intelligence into a single molecule. So instead, we pursued a much simpler algorithm. The robot performs a random walk, if it bumps into a cargo, it picks up the cargo and continue the random walk. And if it bumps into a destination that matches the type of the cargo, it drops off the cargo and continue the random walk while searching for other cargos. 
Now, the implementation of this algorithm is very simple. The robot should be able to walk around in random directions, pick up a cargo, and drop off a cargo, and that's it. So now it is conceivable to build this much intelligence into a single molecule, and more specifically, a single DNA molecule in our case. Now the mechanism that we use to create motion is called DNA strand displacement. As you know, DNA strands can bind to each other if their sequences match, meaning A pairs with T and C pairs with G. If there is an invading strand with just the right sequence, it can bind to the partially bound strand, and the two strands will then compete for the complementary strand, and the previously bound strand will be released. So the process is initiated by a very short single-stranded domain that is called the toehold. Now this animation shows the dynamic process. The invading strand has a toehold colored in red, on which complementary toehold domain hanging off from the double helix. That starts a competition with a blue strand. And then base pairs are being opened and closed very quickly, moving back and forth force until the blue strand is released and the invading strand now becomes part of the double helix. Then the technique that we use to build a testing ground for DNA robots is called DNA origami. This is invented by Paul Rotman at Caltech. So this technique folds a long single stranded DNA into any desired shape such as a smiley face with the help of hundreds of short DNA strands. And because each short strand has a unique sequence and occupies a unique position in the structure, they can be extended to attach to other molecules and create any desired molecular pattern by simply selecting which locations are extended. And for example, by laying a track made of substrate for a deoxyribozyme, a robot with deoxyribozyme legs can be guided to make a turn while walking on the surface of this DNA origami structure. So in our case, well, we wanted to program a DNA robot for more sophisticated tasks than not just walking. So we developed three modular building blocks that can be composed together to perform a task. And now in these diagrams, squiggle lines indicate short domains of DNA strands that are just a few uh, bases. And the straight lines indicate longer domains that are over a dozen bases, but still relatively short. Now, the first building block is for random walk. So when the robot, which is just a single strand of DNA, is bound to a DNA origami testing ground by one leg domain and one foot domain, it won't fall off in a million years. But it has a single stranded free foot that can bind to a complementary foot domain on a nearby track strand. And then the two track strands will compete for binding to the robot's leg in a strand displacement reaction. When the robot is only bound to the previous track uh, just by the short foot domain, the foot can spontaneously dissociate, allowing the robot to make one step from a track location to another. And this is a conceptual animation uh, of how the robot makes a single step. It first forms a few base pairs with the adjacent track strand, followed by strand displacement, and finally dissociation of a few base pairs. So note that the geometry and the total number of base pairs are exactly the same before and after the robot takes a step, and therefore no energy is being consumed in this walking process. And then adding a hand and an arm domain to the robots allows for cargo pickup. So the cargo molecule can be a DNA strand itself, or any other molecule that is conjugated to DNA. So in our case, we used a fluorescent molecule, which allow us to monitor where the cargo is. And the robot should be able to walk around just as before. And when it gets close to a cargo molecule, which is also attached to the surface of the DNA nanostructure, now the hand domain will bind to the complementary hand domain on the cargo strand and strand displacement will occur within the arm domain until the cargo molecule is transferred to the robot. In this case, a few more base pairs formed within the hand domain, so this step is energetically driven forward. 
And then the robot will just continue to walk around while carrying our cargo. So finally, for the cargo to be dropped off, we added a short cargo domain on the cargo strand, like a delivery address of a package, and created a go strand that has the complementary cargo domain together with a hand and an arm domain. So when the robot carrying our cargo gets close to the go location, the go strand will actively grab the cargo away from the robot, and this is similar to the process of cargo pickup. Okay, now to sort multiple types of cargoes, we only need to give each cargo domain a unique DNA sequence, like a unique zip code for each type of package, so that cargo one can only be recognized by go one and cargo two by go two. And with this design, let's find out if the robot can indeed perform cargo sorting. So here's what the testing ground looks like. We have two types of cargos, which are fluorescent molecules with two different colors, and they are initially at unordered location near one edge of the DNA nanostructure. And then the two separate goal locations are near the other edge. And we place the robot in the center of this testing ground. So to monitor where the cargo is, we used a quencher molecule at each goal location. So when the cargo is successfully dropped off at a goal location, we expect to see a decrease of fluorescence signal. And it's like turning off a molecular light bulb. So from this data, you can see that cargo one was successfully dropped off at goal one. And then combining two sets of experiments together, it was clear that the robot was able to sort two types of cargos with multiple cargos per type. Then with microscopy images, we can look at individual molecules and convince ourselves that the cargo molecules were indeed delivered to their destinations, one type near the bottom left corner of the testing ground and the other type near the bottom right corner. The next, we placed multiple robots on the same testing ground to collectively perform a sorting task. And we expected these robots would just wander around the DNA nanostructure surface, and occasionally they will bump into each other, but mostly they will be doing the same cargo pickup and drop off as when they were alone. And in this data, you see that multiple robots can sort the cargos more effectively and more quickly. And with a very simple model, we were able to semi-quantitatively reproduce the experiment data. And now you probably have noticed that the robot is very slow and it takes about um, five minutes to make a single step. So it's natural to ask the question, can it be faster? Well, a study from Nils Waters group at the University of Michigan looked at the same reaction mechanism, but with a smaller feet of the robots and a reverse to strand orientation so that rather than walking upright, the robot walks head over heels. And both of these changes promoted faster motion mobility. And now from the experimental measurements, this robot walks at 1.4 seconds per step. So this is still um, about 500 times slower than protein motors, but it is already 200 times faster than the cargo sorting robot. So there's a hope in terms of better understanding of the mechanism in order to build better robots. And another strategy is, of course, to take advantage of the faster protein motors and integrate with DNA or RNA components to improve their programmability. And examples of these motors include one from Andrew Turberfield's group at Oxford and another from Zev Bryant's group at Stanford. OK, to summarize our work, I believe it is important that the same robot design can be used to sort more uh, uh, sort more types of cargos and more cargos per type. And this is because the correct job off is simply encoded in the sequence based recognition between cargo molecules and their destination. And so after dropping off a cargo, the robot will simply uh, start searching for another cargo. And there is also no constraint on the initial locations of the cargos. So the robot performs a random walk to search the entire testing ground. And except for picking up and dropping off, there is no energy consumed for walking, so the robot could potentially work on a much larger testing ground. Okay, so we managed yeah. to build DNA robots performing yeah. 
um, just, more sophisticated task than previously. Just to interrupt. Oh, no, was there a question? Yeah, we've got a question that's probably relevant So at this point. So um, yeah. Christopher Rowlands asks, what's the performance advantage of mediating the, the search for the, the targets via the robot? Why not just let the, the, why not just release the strands into solution and let them find their binding partners just by diffusing? That's a great question. So you can imagine that if we let the molecules find the destination by diffusion because of the hybridization will still occur or strand displacement will still occur, you do have this behavior of the molecules landing at the destination. However, if you were to do that, then the entire test tube will be performing exactly one task and only capable of performing that exactly one task. But now if you have this uh, nanostructure testing ground and you have this robot sorting the cargos facilitated by random working on this 2D surface, then you can imagine it's potentially possible, and we demonstrated some simple cases in our paper as well, you could have uh, a large number of testing grounds in parallel. For example, each testing ground would have a different number of robots, depending on the difficulty of the task. It will have a slightly different uh, number of cargo types or goal types. It could have different, uh, very different cargos and goals on different testing grounds. So all these individual cargo sorting tasks could be different, yet the entire test tube could be com composed of millions to even billions copies of different tasks taking place. Advantage of parallel um, between those different tasks that is not possible if you simply just have diffusion without any geometry at all. Does that make sense? I think that's a good answer. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I guess Chris can we can carry it on at the end if, if if Chris isn't satisfied. And there's one other question which you might as well answer now because I think you're about to move on to a new topic, which is: Have you looked at different origami shapes and/or locations of the drop-off points, and how about biasing and random walk? random walk with different foot affinities? That's definitely a nice thing to consider. So biasing them uh, for certain tasks would definitely have an advantage if you already have certain information about how you want to bias the random walk process. But if you have no information at all about what the initial uh, distribution of the cargo molecules would be, then maybe if biasing the random walk could actually make it less efficient because might get into, let's say, some dead end structure, and because it's biased forward, so it won't be able to efficiently back out of that dead end, and thus in that process, it would even take longer for the robot to get the job done. So my answer is, yes, it will be very interesting to consider a biased random walk, and depending on the task, you might want to consider such mechanisms very carefully. Great, thanks. I'll okay, excellent. Off. <laughs> okay, so, um, right, so I was summarizing a few properties we believe are the desired properties of this particular system. And um, so now I want to point out that, so even though that we were able to uh, build this particular DNA, DNA robot that performed more sophisticated tasks than previously possible, but we do not yet have a knowledge about how to build general purpose molecular robots that can perform uh, a wide range of tasks by composing different building blocks that are readily available to everyone. And to get there, we need more simple algorithms and more modular building blocks to perform more collective behaviors until there are enough understanding for the development of programming languages that will work in practice. So Namita Saref, a graduate student in my lab, is now working on a maze solving robot to develop another simple algorithm and a new building block that will hopefully get us one step closer towards the general purpose molecular robots that we're hoping for. OK, yes, moving on. Next, how do we embed computation within molecular systems? We know that from bacteria's capability to follow simple chemical gradients to the brain's capability to distinguish complex odor information, specific patterns of molecular signals is an essential type of computation in biological organisms. And inspired by the biological neural network in the brain, 
computational models have been developed to create artificial neural networks that perform sophisticated pattern recognition tasks. And one particularly desired property of neural network computation is that the same network could be reprogrammed to perform different pattern recognition tasks. So 10 years ago, working with Eric Winfrey and Shuki Brook, I made a DNA-based neural network that can recognize four-bit patterns. One or two clues that are encoded in short DNA strands were sufficient for a test tube of DNA molecules to figure out which of the four remembered four-bit patterns is most compatible with a clue. And obviously, that was not smart enough for many tasks that you might want to program a molecular machine to do. So a question that motivated my lab's research is how much intelligence can be programmed into artificial molecular machines? And when Kevin Cherry joined my lab as a graduate student, he was determined to make neural networks much smarter. And now he has successfully scaled up DNA neural networks from recognizing 4-bit to 100-bit molecular patterns. So in this work, we implemented a very simple competitive neural network model called winner-take-all, which is inspired by the lateral inhibition and competition observed among biological neurons in the brain. So here's the function. If a, uh, for, for a number of inputs that are real values, a binary output is one if and only if the corresponding input is the largest, which means the output indicates who the winner is. And then adding a layer that computes the weighted sum of a number of inputs before the winner take all layer allows pattern recognition. So here's an example. Let's consider a circuit that is designed to distinguish a letter L from T. And we can simply use the two target patterns as weights. If an input pattern looks like a letter L, but one bit. And now the two weighted sums are calculated as four and two. And because four is greater than two, the winner take all layer should compute that Y1 is one and Y2 is zero, which means the input is recognized as L. In this example, the weights are binary, and the function is equivalent to computing the smallest Hamming distance between inputs and weights. But the model also allows analog weights, which are more powerful than just binary. For example, if the input pattern is heavily corrupted, it may result in a tie and thus cannot be classified. But if the weights and analog, if the weights have analog values that basically show which bits are more important than the others in each memory, then highly corrupted input patterns may still be successfully classified. And because of how simple the circuit function is, there exists a set of also very simple chemical reactions that can implement the winner take all computation. So I'm not going to explain all these reactions for the uh, interest of time, but I will tell you about one reaction, the pairwise annihilation that allows all molecular species, in our case DNA strands, to compete with each other until there is only one winner left. So here, there's a mostly double-stranded molecule that we call an annihilator, and it can bind to a single-stranded DNA signal that is called SI. And because the DNA sequence of the orange domain in the uh, signal molecule is designed to be identical to the orange domain in the annihilator, so they compete with each other for the complementary strand. Now, if SI is present, this process is reversible, so the signal strand will not be consumed. However, if signal SI and SJ are both present, then SJ can bind to the annihilator from the opposite side. And when both signal strand branch migrate to the middle, the annihilator will be split apart. And then both signal strands will be turned into waste products that cannot interact with other molecules. So this process ensures that different signal molecules will continue to kill each other until there is only one winner left. Similarly, all other functions involved in a winner take on neural network can be implemented using a set of fairly simple DNA molecules. As you can see from the diagram here, they're just uh, short single strands or short double stranded molecules. 
And now once we mix all these molecules in a test tube, they can perform surprisingly complex tasks. And in our study, we chose a well-defined and understood task, which is handwritten digit recognition. But in real world applications, these molecular handwriting could represent any information of interest, such as a gene expression profile, and the recognition results could represent any desired classification task, such as differentiating viral and bacterial infections. So the digital recognition task allow us to evaluate basically two things. One is the complexity and the, the other is the diversity of molecular patterns that a DNA neural network is capable of recognizing. For example, the complexity will tell us how many unique microRNA or mRNA species can be simultaneously detected. And then the diversity will tell us how different an individual's gene expression profile can be tolerated compared to a common profile. So we went ahead and took 100 example sixes and 100 example sevens from the MNIST database, which is often used to test machine learning algorithms. And then we averaged them to determine the weights. Now these weights are analog, and so in this diagram it shows darker bits indicate uh, that they are more commonly used in the examples. Now each bit in the memory corresponds to just two DNA molecules that can perform weight multiplication function, and the concentration of these molecules correspond to the value of the weights. When the neural network is used to recognize corrupted test patterns, each bit in the inputs correspond to the presence or absence of a specific DNA strand. So in the database, there are um, a total of over 14,000 example handwritten digits six and seven. If we look at where the example patterns are in the weighted sum space, it basically tells us how easy or hard the winner take all computation uh, should be. Because further away from the diagonal line is easier and closer to the diagonal line is harder. And about 2% of these patterns are on the wrong side of the line, so it is impossible for our circuit to recognize these patterns easily. And 8% of the patterns are fairly close to the diagonal line, which we expect to be experimentally difficult. And 90% of the patterns are far enough from the diagonal line, which we expect our circuit to recognize correctly. So then we chose 36 examples from these patterns based on a uniform distribution and use those to perform the experiments. So the perfect patterns, which are the same as in memories but in binary, were correctly recognized. As you see here, the green fluorescent signal going high indicates a six, and the yellow fluorescent signal going high indicates a seven. But more importantly, patterns was up to 30 bits of deviation from the memory, which means very sloppy handwriting, were also recognized. And then to scale up the number of memories, we took a grouping approach and divided nine memories into three groups in two ways, shown as the three rows and three columns here. So each Y output indicates which row the memory is in, and each Z output indicates which column the memory is in. And then we determine the weights for each group using an average then subtract method. So take the average of 100 examples for each in-group digit and subtract the average of 100 examples for each out-of-group digit. And you might be wondering, uh, we can use much more sophisticated machine learning algorithms and, and figure out the weights by computing it on a laptop and to improve the performance of the neural network, that would do a lot better than this very simple algorithm called weight uh, average and subtract. And that's absolutely true. But we intentionally chose a very simple one so that learning can later be implemented within the molecular system itself rather than being done on the laptop, which I'll touch on just in a bit. OK, so now our experimental data showed that indeed all nine digits can be simultaneously recognized for a total of 99 representative examples. And Kevin developed an online software tool. It converts a user-defined set of memories and test patterns into program code describing a DNA neural network, which can then be used to simulate the kinetics of the network behavior. And it also provides sequences uh, of the DNA strands required to experimentally construct the DNA neural network. 
And this is what the web interface looked like. And so we used to the software tool in a class and even undergrads and graduate students with minimal prior background were able to design and create their own DNA neural networks with very complex behavior in just a few hours. OK, so now the ongoing work is more exciting to us because instead of us computing the values of weights and encoding them in the concentrations of molecules that we pipette into a test tube, we're now building DNA neural networks that learn from their own environments. And Kevin is exploring supervised learning, while Tian Chi Song, a postdoc in my lab, is interested in unsupervised learning. And Kevin has built an adaptive memory where concentrations of weight molecules can be adjustable in response to training signals. While Tian Chi has come up with an elegant solution that allows the weight molecules to be restored after each round of computation, which is critical for unsupervised learning. Okay. So I've showed examples of simple mechanics in DNA robots and computation in DNA circuits, but I haven't discussed how these DNA circuits could be used to control DNA robots. Well, imagine that the output of a DNA circuit, which is often a single strand, could be used to activate or inhibit the motion of a DNA robot. Now, this mechanism should be relatively straightforward to engineer in a test tube environment. But on the other hand, if we want to build a molecular machine for exploring a natural environment and possibly traveling a long distance, then the free floating circuit components may simply get lost. So alternatively, DNA robots could be controlled by DNA circuit to the surface of the same DNA nanostructure, for example, DNA origami can be used as a circuit breadboard, and each circuit component can be tethered to a specific location on the breadboard. And then the spatial arrangement of these components will simply determine the function that a circuit computes. Imagine an artificial cell whose membrane is made of DNA origami nanostructures, and on the inside uh, surface of each origami, there tethers a DNA circuit and they will be able to orchestrate the inner world of the artificial cell. So if we had such an artificial cell, how do we make it reconfigure itself for different tasks? For example, could the artificial cell equip itself with the right tools at the right time? Could the decision be made in response to a changing environment? OK, at this point, you might be thinking, this is too much dreaming. We don't even have any molecular machines that looks like a submarine and is of size similar to a cell. Well, there have been recent advances that scaled up the complexity of DNA nanostructures of sizes similar to a small bacteria. So a challenge is Hi everyone, sorry, we seem to be having a technical issue at the moment. I think Luli might have dropped out of the call. Bear with me, I'm just going to see if I can find her and bring her back in. Oh dear. <laughs> Apologies, we seem to have lost Lily. Bear with me, I will try and find her. Oh, it looks like I was muted. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> okay, excellent. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Seemed like I just got kicked out <laughs> or my computer was doing something. Okay, now I started sharing screen again. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Um, okay, I'm not sure when I got cut out. 
So let's just start over from this one slide. I was talking about there was a challenge. So the challenge is to develop a mechanism that allows information based autonomous reconfiguration in these DNA nanostructures. And um, ideally, we want this mechanism to be able to use to build um, to develop a building blocks that are compatible with general purpose reconfiguration tasks. So for example, um, we want to be able to include the kind of tasks that allow structural components at any desired location to be reconfigured at any desired order. So this is what uh, Philip Peterson and Greg Tigomirov did. They discovered this mechanism that we now call tile displacement when they tried to understand a mysterious result on nanostructure self-assembled from DNA origami tiles. So I don't have the time to tell the discovery story today, which was a fun story, but I will briefly show you what tile displacement is and what it can do. So you already know that a strand displacement, what strand displacement is, an invading strand, which is colored in orange shown here, can bind to a double-stranded complex via the short toehold domain. And then branch migration occurs um, when two strands are competing for binding to the same complementary strand until the previously bound strand is released and the remaining strand becomes unbound. So now this uh, tile displacement follows the same abstract principle but occurs at a much larger scale between interacting DNA origami structures that were referred to as tiles. And different from binding by a string of nucleotide, the DNA origami tiles bind to each other by a set of stacking bonds and very short sticky ends. On um, so now you show that invading tile is colored in orange, and the DNA origami tile have a good degree of structural flexibility between adjacent helices and along the seam um, between the four triangles composing each tile, so that the invader tile can bind to the two tile complex via a domain that has just a few staples. And then branch migration occurs between this perpendicular, uh, occurs perpendicular to the direction of the adjacent DNA base stacking when the two tiles are competing for binding to the complementary tile until the previously bound tile is released. And so this is just showing that two different viewpoints where you can see the same process where the tiles can just bend a little bit to allow uh, displacement. Okay, so we measured the kinetics of tile displacement with varying number of staple strands and varying lengths of sticky ends in the toehold domain and demonstrate that uh, we can control the reaction rates over about five orders of magnitude. And then we show that a few example reconfiguration processes, including this one, that is a two by two tile array, first reconfigured from a frown to a grimace and then to a smile. And then another case, a frown that can only reconfigure itself if two types of invaders are both present. And we also showed that tile displacement can take place at any location of an array, including the interior location. And then these reactions um, at different locations can also take place in any desired order, as shown in this tic-tac-toe game. So there are practical issues that need to be resolved. For example, the yield of reconfiguration uh, is, uh, these reconfigured structures, they decreased quite a bit with an increasing number of cascaded steps. Well, we hope that tile displacement has now opened up many possibilities for future developments in reconfigurable micromachines. And from a fundamental point of view, tile displacement has established displacement as a generalizable concept that not only occurs between small DNA strands, but also occurs between DNA nanostructures at a different scale and in a different dimension. And now the information encoded uh, in edges of the 2D structure could potentially be extended to surfaces of 3D DNA nanostructures, and that would probably allow even more general forms of structure displacement. So as we now know, uh, tile displacement is particularly good for complex structural reconfiguration, while strand displacement is particularly good for complex computation. So integrating these two mechanisms across scales will allow us to combine their unique advantages to create even more sophisticated behaviors in reconfigurable micro machines. And to do that, Dominic Scalise is working on demonstrating how an input strand is released to a larger output circuit used to activate a tile. 
And at the same time, Sam Davison is building strand displacement circuits on tile surfaces. When specific output signals um, are released, they can be used to initiate part of a circuit to be swapped out for updated circuit function in response to a changing environment. OK, to summarize, I hope that with effort, the combination of simple mechanics, embedded computation, and task-specific reconfiguration will allow us to build smart and efficient molecular machines that eventually approach the sophistication of life itself. To how programming language have enabled everyone to write their own software, molecular programming languages will eventually allow everyone to write their own molecular apps and enable embedded control within chemistry, medicine, and materials. Okay, so the focus of my lab is to establish the foundations for future um, molecular technologies. And many of these things that we do may or may not turn out to be useful. But I feel very lucky to have a group of excellent students and postdocs who are excited to work with me on crazy ideas that may one day change the world. So I'll end with this lovely photo when we were still able to stand next to each other within six feet. Oh, and I want to say that the tallest person among us is starting as an assistant professor at Berkeley. So he has open positions for graduate students and postdocs. And please contact him if you're interested. He's a wonderful scientist and a wonderful person. I'm sure you will love working with him. OK, that was my little bit of advertisement. <laughs> But now I'm ready to take questions. Uh, am I muted? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Ah, now we can hear, can hear me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, sorry. So weird, right? You, you, everyone's trying to press the unmute button to give uh, a clap at the end of the talk, and it's like this weird silence. Um, thanks, Lulu. That was great. We've got a couple of questions that were brought up during the um, talk itself, which I'll go back to, and then I guess we'll throw the floor open. Um, so the first one, uh, well, was a bit um, uh, far-reaching, but perhaps the the most directly applicable part of the question is, um, sorry, my thing's scrolling quite badly um because people are adding new questions um as i remember it was something along the lines of is the programming approach very hardware dependent um in this uh in, in dna nanotechnology and is that a problem it is absolutely hardware dependent that's why I feel like it is important when we develop circuit architectures, we have this programming language notion in mind. So we develop the circuit architectures that can support versatile programming languages. For example, when we choose molecular building blocks, I was emphasizing at the very beginning that we want to choose really simple molecules because they work more robustly in a test tube environment. However, we also want to simultaneously be thinking, can this building block enable us to build a variety of different functions uh, that we are interested in? And if so, then this particular kind of building block could potentially serve as a general purpose building block for general purpose molecular programming languages. So we can't basically think about the molecular programming language only after we already have decided what molecules we're going to use to build things. We have to think about it at the very beginning when we think about those two questions simultaneously. And there are a lot of challenges involved, of course. Yeah, I, th I think it is it is fair to say that there are lots of efforts, including from people like people at Microsoft, to abstract yes, this process as far as possible. And in particular, DNA strand displacement net. If you're building a basic DNA strand displacement network, you almost don't need to think about the hardware at all. You 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 take it as a given, and uh, and you're designing at a much higher level. Um, but if you're trying yes. to engineer a new, a completely new molecular functionality, at, you know, like for example, your tile displacement, that then you need to think about what's actually going on chemically again. Um, I guess. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, even for the first case of scenario, when you can compile arbitrary chemical reactions down to DNA implementations using strand displacement, combining all the efforts that the community has been making, wonderful efforts, but we still kind of have to think about the low level mechanism, even if theoretically we know how to convert an abstract function to DNA strand displacement system. But when you design a system and following that particular general principle and mix everything in the test tube, like what Nianzhan did in this uh, wonderful example of an oscillator, strand displacement oscillator, there were still years of effort put into debugging the system at the sequence level and so that the oscillator would work robustly. So we're not, we can't claim that we actually already have a high level programming language that would do the job we want to build a variety of things. But I think we are learning in this process of combining theory and experiments. We're trying to learn what is a um, easier approach that will get us there faster. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah, I totally agree. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have a job, right? Um, but uh, <laughs> the, yeah, certainly, certainly, if you want to, if you want to program A plus B goes to C, that's relatively straightforward. If you want to have precisely the kinetics needed to achieve some yes. complex um functionality then then that's a definitely a separate question um okay so there was a question from um uh, regina uh, greta Carreno. sorry for butchering your name which is uh is the random walk the most efficient method uh of sorting or is there some other type of walk that can be studied although it may have certain disadvantages in other aspects so referring to the first part of your talk so she's thinking think, she's thinking in terms of things like chemotaxis um, you know, chemotaxis goes down a gradient rather than 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 just following a random walk. So, yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So one of the main reasons that we chose random walk rather than more sophisticated ways uh, of thinking about a more efficient algorithm is the uh, is the focus on energy efficiency, because currently, which I didn't go into the detail, but many of the uh, strand displacement systems that we're able to build um, consume energy in a way that they would only be able to show a temporary kinetics before the system go to equilibrium. And this is because they are powered by a number of DNA strands in the test tube, and once they make more base pair, they drive the reaction forward, but then when those molecules are used up, the system can no longer perform interesting functions. So there are separate efforts on trying to build chemical batteries that can be used to, to make the system run much longer. But before that is successful, uh, when we try to think about an algorithm for cargo sorting, when we don't really have an energy supply that's available, then we simply can't do much if the uh, molecule required for take each individual step actually requires energy to do that. So that is why we chose the random walk mechanism, which does not require energy and which means it's not time efficient. But then we're hoping that once we start from there to try to explore what is possible with random walk as a very basic mechanism, and then we start bringing in other thoughts about how to build uh, chemical energies to make the system have more sustained dynamics, then that would be a very good point for us to start thinking about more efficient algorithms, more time efficient algorithms. Yeah, I guess, and I guess, yeah, I, um, guess I guess not, um, I'm echoing. Not. I'm echoing. Uh, yes, again. we can hear you. Yeah. So, yeah. I was just saying that was, um, if you, it's not just yeah. You you if you if you want to walk in a systematic direction, you need to use fuel, which means you need to yeah. get the fuel from somewhere and maintain right. it. But you also need to design the coupling mechanism whereby yes. the fuel only gets spent if it goes through your engine, which is also like a whole world of complexity to add into the challenge of selectively picking up things putting it down, I guess, yeah. as well. Yeah, but that, that is something that the community is actively working on towards um, future molecular machines. So there's hope it's just uh, at the time we demonstrated the cargo sorting robot, we we're not quite there yet to have those mechanisms available that allow us to do that. OK, so I, I think that's a good answer to the question. Regina, if you're not happy with that, please do uh, chip in. Um, so Philippa Samella? Uh, asked, can artificial DNA bound cell activation be modeled to replicate, replicate T cell and B cell activation? <laughs> okay, that is something that I don't think I have a good answer for because 
one of the things that we do is when we try to program these artificial molecular machines, we are, except I'm speaking for my lab, particularly in this case, we're not really specifically thinking about any biological applications. So which means the system we develop are not directly uh, integratable with all the biological systems that one might care about. But there are a large body of work in the field uh, that have demonstrated the compatibility of artificial DNA molecular machines being integrated into a cellular environment and interacted with the biological system. It's just that there's a lot and a variety of very different challenges that needs to be overcome before that could be possible. So I think if the question is to say, can we directly use our machine to program those kind of biological systems that we're interested in? And the answer is, it's not immediately possible, but there are ways that could allow us to get there eventually. I mean, I think that's one of the, the key um, long-term goals is to, is to have yeah. like clever, clever, clever doctors in your, that you can inject into your, into your blood, right? Or something like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> So John Gertz asks, if I understand correctly, the uh, neural network systems you've developed all have linear activation functions. Have you thought about ways to implement nonlinear neural networks? Yes, we have. We explored a few different activation functions in the lab during some kind of summer projects, um, but we didn't get very far there, um, mainly because there are definitely possibilities to tune the activation function. But then, based on our preliminary study, we did not actually see um, uh, substantial advantages there because the linear function, essentially, when we say it's a linear function, it's in the ideal case, a linear function. But when you actually look at the simulation of the uh, uh, system we're looking at, for example, in the previous uh, network we demonstrate, it's a uh, perceptual model. So we say that we have this uh, comparing the weighted sum to a threshold. But nonetheless, it's not really a hot threshold because the at the molecular implementation level, it was a competitive mechanism where there's a faster reaction pathway and there's a slow reaction pathway in order to create this thresholding. So in that sense, the thresholding itself is already a softer, more or less a softer thresholding mechanism. And you can potentially tune the slope of that function by changing the reaction rate of those two competitive pathways. So there are ways you can do that. And I think it's, um, Definitely interesting to explore all those possibilities, but we haven't got very far with that. Great. OK, so the, the next one is a bit more bread and butter from Wei Shi Sim, which is uh, what temperatures do you run these systems at? Oh, they're all at room temperature. So I guess I guess some of the origamis, you, you presumably you fold the origamis with a temperature ramp, but then you run the run the dynamic experiments at room temperature. Yes. So when you prepare the structure, you need to put them in a thermal cycle, heat it up and cool it down. So the structure forms nicely without uh, much tangle. But then once you have the structure ready, all the dynamic behavior were programmed at room temperature. All the interactions took place between the structures happened at room temperature. So um, there's, a, there's a couple more technical questions, but while we're doing that, could you possibly put up the slide with the contact details for uh, uh, Gregory's position? Yes. Um, uh, there we go. Is that visible to people? Can people see that? Yes, we can see it. Great. I think my computer's really slow <laughs> for some reason. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so last couple of talks. The question is, how is the breadboard built, um, and how are the components inserted? I guess, which I guess the question is, how does DNA origami work? Um, uh, so I guess, yeah, we just ref we would refer that person to. I'll, I will send a link to that person on DNA origami because that's a whole yes. extra topic that wasn't really a topic of this talk. Um, right. And then Jurek asks, hi, Lulu, you mentioned the SD system could be potentially used to monitor and combine gene expression levels. Can you tell us more about the potential biological applications and what are the limitations? Yes, so that work was actually done by Georg Selig's group uh, at UW Seattle. So in that experimental system, they took a simpler... Oh.
and lost her again. Hello? Sorry, we seem to have lost her again. I will just see if I can find her and bring her back into the call. Yeah, just about, just about the technology is uh, just about. <laughs> I'm, whilst we're doing that, I'm just posting a link into the chat about how there's a review on DNA origami from 2017 in Cell. Uh, and that's a discussion of how the sort of the, how to make these breadboards essentially and do other things with them. Not everyone wants to just use them as a breadboard. Um, so the person who asked about that, hopefully that that will answer their question. Um, they are really cool. So yeah, introduced by Rothermund about 14 years ago. Um, and ever since then, people have loved making funny things out of them. And Lulu's back. I am back. Sorry, I have no idea what just happened again, but I'm back. <laughs> okay, I wanted to go back to the uh, the question. So this, I think, was the uh, slide that I was trying to refer to. So this work was actually done by Garrick Selix Group from uh, UW Seattle. And in this system, they took a uh, linear, uh, linear classifier built from DNA which follows a fairly simple, a fairly similar principle compared to the basic building blocks of DNA neural ne networks that we showed. Uh, so then, but they look at this kind of uh, circuit um, and then use the um, gene expression profile as the input of the circuit. In that case, they look at mRNA signals and see if those could be used as recognized as part of the input signal to the circuit. And that's why you can look at a disease profile when you look at multiple of those mRNA expressions. So that was a very beautiful work. So if they, I forgot who asked the question, but you could potentially look up this paper and then you will see more details in that particular publication. Great. I think that actually gets to the end of the questions that we've got in the chat. If anyone feels that they've been skipped or, or harshly done by or not properly answered, do, uh, uh, well, we're starting to get to the point where you could probably actually unmute and unmute and ask yourself um, uh, or, or type in the chat. Um, lots of people saying great talk. Thank you very much. So again, I'll, I'll reiterate that. Um, one yeah, final thing. Oh, go on. Sorry. I was going to say yes. Thank you. Excellent talk. Very interesting and inspiring. I enjoyed it. And thank you for the link as well. OK. <laughs> Great. So I had one question was uh, the, the the really the, the DNA, the tile displacement. Is that is that published or is that is that currently? Uh, ah, yes, it is published. Let me go pull that reference out. It looks just you went through it quite quickly, but it looked like the the rate, the limiting rate was about the same as the strand displacement limiting rate. Was that correct? It's about 10 times slower, actually. Oh, about 10 times slower. But OK, so not that much slower. OK. Um. Yeah, this is a reference. OK, OK, I somehow missed. I somehow managed to miss that. OK, <laughs> <laughs> my bad. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, OK, um, so that's 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 probably everything from me um, again. Thank you to uh, everyone for joining us and asking very good questions. Lulu, um, you need to have breakfast, I guess, or something. <laughs> so, um, I'll, let you, I'll let you get away and uh, hopefully see you soon.